I don't think Yu-Gi-Oh needs an introduction, but here it is. Yu-Gi-Oh was a manga created by Kazuki Takahashi and published in Shonen Jump starting in September of 1996. The main premise is that a boy named Yugi Muto solves an ancient millennium puzzle that allows him to transform into a darker version of himself, a version with supernatural powers, and may or may not have been an Egyptian pharaoh. Spoilers. The series featured battles performed not through combat, but through various games, which Yugi would play against the villain of the week, eventually defeating them and delivering a penalty game, essentially delivering their just desserts. This is Mitsumi Gatoru, or the Third-Eyed One created by Osamu Tezuka in 1974, though the anime adaptation wouldn't come until 1990. It's a pretty interesting watch, especially if you're familiar with the Yu-Gi-Oh! manga, because if you are, then you'll notice that the first chapters are strikingly identical. Mitsumi Gatoru follows a boy named Hosuke Shiraku. Hosuke is smaller than his classmates, and this leads to him being the target of bullies, but Hosuke isn't phased and tries to be their friend. This upbeat, childish nature angers Saburo Kido, and causes him to throw Hosuke in the school swimming pool, while Hosuke's only real friend, a girl named Chiyoko Wato, stands up for him, berating the bullies. You've probably already noticed the similarities, though the events are moved around a bit. Yu-Gi-Oh! opens with Yugi, a small, kind-hearted boy who gets bullied by two students named Honda and Jonochi. Yugi's friend Anzu Mizaki stands up for Yugi and sends them running off, but unbeknownst to Yugi, Jonochi steals a piece from Yugi's Millennium Puzzle, which he throws in the school swimming pool. Mitsumi Gatoru follows this up by having Chiyoko and Hosuke go to a museum where they find an ancient statue. Like Hosuke, the statue has a bandage in the shape of an X on its forehead, which makes Chiyoko curious about the bandage on Hosuke's head. Chiyoko tries to take the bandage off, but Hosuke tells her that if he takes it off, his dad will beat him. Shoko takes it off revealing Hosuke's third eye, and with it unleashing a much darker side of Hosuke. When his third eye is opened, Hosuke regains his memories as an evil prince who in ancient times ruled over a class of three-eyed superhumans. Thematically and aesthetically, we can already see Takahashi's inspiration for Yu-Gi-Oh's dark Yugi taking shape, as the darker version of Hosuke not only sports a third eye on his forehead, but also turns his school jacket into a cape, design elements that are heavily associated with Yu-Gi-Oh. This actually works out quite well for Takahashi's manga since the Eye of Horus is already a symbol associated with ancient Egypt, and it appears on all of the Millennium items. But in earlier chapters, it's very common to see it appear on Yugi's forehead, invoking the same image as the evil Hosuke. Backtracking to the scene where Hosuke and Chiyoko visit a museum, I can't help but notice how similar this feels to a scene that precedes Yu-Gi-Oh!'s Battle City arc, where Yugi and Anzu visit the Domino City Museum and discover a stone tablet that serves as a hint towards the origin of the dark spirit of the Millennium Puzzle. In the first episode of the anime adaptation, Hosuke is portrayed as a full-on villain, but following that episode, Hosuke's transformations usually serve the purpose of delivering just desserts onto others or saving him and Chiyoko from dangerous situations. Yu-Gi-Oh! skips this conflict in Dark Yugi's first appearance, instead portraying him as a protector and arguably a metaphor for the strength and courage someone of weak stature might hide deep inside them. Hosuke, on the other hand, is straight up fucking dastardly. Even though he frequently acts to protect himself and Chiyoko, the series makes it clear that he is still a villain, and after defeating that episode's villain, Chiyoko is forced to slap the bandage back on Hosuke's forehead. For example, in one episode, Kido bullies Hosuke by dumping soggy ramen noodles on his head, so when the evil Hosuke emerges, he builds a machine that turns Kido's brain into soggy noodles. The effect only lasts for three days, but Hosuke says he'll continue working on the machine until the effect is permanent, which is where Chiyoko has to step in to put an end to his evil plot. Also, I couldn't help but notice while editing how similar the panels are of Hosuke designing his machine to the chapter where Yugi makes a maze out of spray paint during the Zambire story. The Dark Yugi isn't as malicious, and there's very few examples outside of anime filler where the Dark Yugi isn't working to achieve the goals of the smaller Yugi, just with more power and confidence. The only instance that comes close is in the Duelist Kingdom arc, where Yugi is forced to duel Kaiba in order to gain entrance into Pegasus' castle. Yugi is about to win, so Kaiba, who is fighting for a chance to face Pegasus himself and rescue the soul of his younger brother, says that if Yugi lands the finishing blow, he will jump to his death. Desperate to rescue Yugi's grandpa, the Dark Yugi declares an attack, though the small Yugi has to step in and call it back. But even here, where we see a prominent disconnect between Yugi and Dark Yugi's principles, Dark Yugi is still acting to achieve the goal of the smaller Yugi. The spirit that resides inside the Millennium Puzzle doesn't have a strong motivation to save local game shop owner Sugoroku Muto. Yugi does, which makes the scene read as Yugi having an inner conflict with himself. 
This allegory for Dark Yugi representing the hidden attributes inside the regular Yugi is probably what sets Yu-Gi-Oh's concepts apart most from Mitsume Gatoru, and it's unfortunate that these aspects aren't as clear in the anime adaptation, especially in the English dub. For example, in the sub, Yugi calls Dark Yugi his other self, while Dark Yugi calls Yugi Aibo. In the dub, they opted to have them refer to each other as Yugi and Yami, which probably felt like it made the dialogue flow more easily in English, but in my opinion, this also muddles the themes of the original and made Yugi the boy as a character feel less important, as if the small Yugi's only contribution is that he's the host of the spirit that does everything for him, which I don't think was the point they were trying to get across. And it's why dub scenes like this bug me way more than stuff like invisible guns. And I don't even know your name. I've been called many things through the ages. Pharaoh, Yu-Gi-Oh, I've been known as Yami. Well, Yami, I'm proud to call you my friend. Of course, Mitsume Gatoru wasn't the only series that inspired Yu-Gi-Oh, and there's actually another story about a boy turning into a darker, more confident version of himself to fight villains that also served a significant influence. Gonagai's Devilman is undeniably one of Yu-Gi-Oh's biggest influences, not just in its core concept, but in its art and its storytelling, with Takahashi even paying tribute to the series directly with cards like Marek's Legendary Fiend, known as Legendary Devil in Japanese. When talking about Devilman references in Yu-Gi-Oh, though, most people immediately turn their finger to Yubel from Yu-Gi-Oh GX. Yubel's androgynous body and their motivation, spurred by their obsessive love of GX protagonist Judai Yuki, is a carbon copy of Satan from the Devilman manga. But full disclosure, I'm going to try to avoid talking about the sequel series just because it's unclear how much, if any, input Takahashi had over those stories. Speaking of Satan, though, this is Ryo Asuka. And this is Ryo Bakura. In the Devilman manga, Ryo is a friend of the hero Akira, but he's far from being a good guy. In fact, in the final arc of the story, it's revealed that Ryo Asuka is actually Satan, revealing their true form as an androgynous angel who is hell-bent on wiping out all of humanity. Design-wise, Bakura has spikes of hair that seem to resemble Satan's wings, and from the Battle City arc onward, Bakura wears a striped shirt that's very similar to Ryo Asuka's. Bakura likewise starts off as a friend of the protagonist until the spirit of the Millennium Ring takes him over. Another similarity that dub viewers probably didn't catch was Dark Bakura's androgyny. Though he is somewhat feminine in appearance, this is heightened in the Japanese dub, where Bakura actually has a female voice actor. In fact, he's portrayed by Yo Inoue of Mobile Suit Gundam fame. And unlike other instances of female voice actors portraying young boys, the feminine aspects of Inoue's voice are fully embraced, making the ties to Devilman stronger and making the character seem more mysterious. It was a decision that I found to be surprisingly thoughtful because even dubbed in Japanese, it's still a show made to sell trading cards. Despite drawing clear inspiration design-wise and even voice-wise from Devilman's depiction of Satan, I found that Dark Bakura's transformation is actually more in line with Toei's interpretation of Devilman. For context, the Devilman manga and Devilman anime are vastly different, one of the biggest differences being out the gate, who Devilman is. In the Toei anime, Devilman is a demon who takes over the body of a dead boy named Akira Fudo. Side note, he's dead because he killed him. And he plans to use Akira's body to take over the world. Devilman meets Akira's friend Miki Makimura and falls in love with her, leading him to change his ways and decide to protect Earth from other demons who have named him a traitor. In the manga, as well as most other adaptations, Akira merges with a powerful demon named Amon. But Akira's pure heart allows him to maintain control of his body, granting him demonic powers and the ability to transform into a demon which he calls Devilman. I realized while writing this that the similarities to Toei Devilman may just come from the fact that manga author Go Nagai worked elements from this interpretation of Devilman into Ryo's backstory. However, there is another comparison that I think leans more heavily into Toei's Devilman specifically, and not so much the manga's version of Satan. And this is Dark Bakura's complete disdain for the body and well-being of his host. Like Toei Devilman, Bakura sees his host body as a tool, which he uses for his own means while mocking the weakness of the good Bakura, which is exactly what Devilman does to Akira in the Toei anime. It's also worth mentioning that Bakura's deck is based around the occult, using cards based around torture devices, Ouija boards, and fiend-type monsters, who in Japanese are called demon types. Bakura's connection to Devilman Satan is made even stronger in the final arc of the manga as we learn that the Dark Bakura is actually the result of the soul of the Thief King Bakura fusing with Zork Necrophades inside the Millennium Ring. 
Zork is the final villain of original Yu-Gi-Oh, a demon born eons before the Millennium items were created from the darkness that resides in human hearts. He is an entity of pure evil and wants nothing more than the complete annihilation of all life. If Bakura is the analog for Ryo Asuka, then Zork is undoubtedly Satan. And while Zork doesn't have the nuance of Satan who hates humans but loves Devil Man, his design does exude the same sexually aggressive aura, I'd say. What I'm talking about is... Zork's enormous cock. Zork's cock, which the dub tried to hide by photoshopping it in every way imaginable, was so shocking to Shonen Jump viewers that Kazuki Takahashi would go on to redesign it for later prints of the manga. And Takahashi would actually give an explanation for this bizarre design in 2008. Takahashi recounted that he'd been neglecting his health as he worked on the manga's later chapters, until one day while drawing, he collapsed and vomited blood. An ambulance rushed him to the hospital where he learned that this was the result of an ulcer brought on by stress. After a few days, Takahashi was allowed to leave the hospital, but the event made him rethink his plans for the final arc of the series. Readership had dropped as the series was entering an arc which wasn't about the Duel Monsters card game, and Takahashi's editor was urging him to rush up the story quickly. At the same time, Takahashi was worried that if this were to happen again, he could possibly die before the manga was finished. And so he decided to rush through the final arc, a decision he said he ultimately regretted. Takahashi would say that he designed Zork when he was still groggy from blood loss. Quote, My lack of blood was obvious at the time if you look at Zork's design. I was actually the one who had gone stark mad. When I went searching for Kazuki Takahashi's influences, I was surprised to find that he hadn't really talked extensively about them in any real capacity. And almost everything I've brought up in this video so far is just educated speculation. He would say that his use of bondage-style clothing and designs like Dark Magician of Chaos were actually inspired by the film Edward Scissorhands, but as far as manga goes, there was only one title that Kazuki Takahashi brought up being a huge influence on him, and that manga was Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Takahashi said that he always enjoyed manga that focused on supernatural battles, and said that the third arc of the manga, Stardust Crusaders, was one of his biggest influences. Knowing this, I can see tons of Takahashi's influences forming from this arc, which was not only set mostly in Egypt, but also featured characters battling with supernatural powers in ways that required them to trick and outsmart their opponents. In fact, I believe Takahashi's entire premise can actually be traced back to a battle in this arc. This is Daniel J. Darby, a gambler from America who the Stardust Crusaders meet during their search for the lair of their enemy, the vampire Dio. Darby offers to tell them where Dio is hiding, but only if they can beat him in a game of chance. Darby, like many of the foes in the series, is a stand user, and his stand ability allows him to steal the souls of anyone he beats in a gamble. When he meets the Stardust Crusaders, Darby explains that he has traveled the world collecting souls of those unfortunate enough to challenge him and lose, dragging their souls out of their body and collecting them in poker chips. Whether it's outsmarting his opponents or outright cheating, Darby will go to any means necessary, culminating in a psychological battle between Darby and this part's protagonist, Jotaro Kujo. Unlike a lot of the earlier enemies in Stardust Crusaders, Jotaro must defeat Darby not by pummeling him, but instead psychologically manipulating him. Darby's trickery makes quick work of Polnareff and Joseph Joestar, and so Jotaro chooses the game of poker as their final game. Jotaro doesn't win simply by defeating Darby at the game, though. The cards are literally stacked against him. Darby had the deck rigged to ensure that he would get the best hand, while Jotaro's cards are completely worthless. But as they play, Jotaro exudes an air of confidence, and he reveals to Darby that his stand, Star Platinum, can move at an incredibly fast speed. So fast that if you take your eyes off him for a second, it's almost like objects are appearing out of nowhere. This concerns Darby that Jotaro may have used his stand, Star Platinum, to switch his cards. And Darby, even if he knows Jotaro cheated to get a better hand, is unable to say anything as claiming Jotaro cheated would reveal that he cheated. And by the rules of his stand, if you're unable to see exactly how someone cheated during the game, it's fair play. These rules have been the reason why Darby's been able to steal souls for so long, and now it's being used against him. Darby tries to bolster himself by saying that Jotaro is bluffing, but then Jotaro raises the ante with the soul of his own mother. But in exchange, he tells Darby that he must ante the secret of Dio's stand. Dio is a villain who is the embodiment of cruelty, and revealing his stand to the enemies would ensure that Darby receives a fate worse than death, and Jotaro demands that Darby call or fold immediately. The stress and anxiety he experiences, unable to determine whether or not Jotaro has switched his cards, leads to Darby having a mental breakdown, causing him to faint and lose the match. Even before Stardust Crusaders received its anime adaptations in 2013 and 2014, the Darby battle was a fan favorite, 
and managed to do something rarely seen in action comics at the time, portray a high-stakes life-or-death battle without combat. JoJo's wasn't the first manga to do this. It wasn't even Hirohiko Araki's first manga to do this. But the psychological back and forth of these characters exchanging strategies in such a limited and mundane capacity definitely resonated with readers. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the popularity of the Darby battle was the reason why Araki would, you know, do it again. Terence Darby is the younger brother of Daniel J. Darby, but unlike his brother who was a gambler, Terence Darby is a gamer. He has a stand similar to his brother. If he defeats someone at a video game, his stand will steal their soul and put them into a doll. What's interesting about the younger Darby though is that despite not being as popular with readers, this battle seems to have more in common with what we'd see in Yu-Gi-Oh. While the older Darby is an arrogant smooth talker, the younger Darby hides his arrogance and his dark side behind a kindly facade and childish interests. Also unlike his brother, the younger Darby says he would never cheat, but in actuality can read people's moves through his stand ability. If he asks a person a question, regardless of how they answer, his stand will show him the correct answer, allowing him to always know what move his opponents will make. This is very similar to Yu-Gi-Oh's most iconic villain, Pegasus Crawford. Though Pegasus certainly does become his own character by dialing up the false kindness and his excessive use of English words. Unbelievable! Bravo! What? Got them! Oh my god! I do think there's at least a little credence to say that he was inspired by the younger Darby. Similarly to how the Darby brothers turn their foes into poker chips and dolls, Pegasus's Millennium Eye allows him to take the souls of his enemies, trapping them within Duel Monsters cards. And specifically like the younger Darby, uses his Millennium Eye to read people's moves so that he can never lose at a game. There's also other factors that may have inspired Yu-Gi-Oh, like how during the younger Darby fight the Stardust Crusaders are dragged into a void that brings them to a deserted island until they win. Kind of like the void that appears around the characters during Shadow Games. As I mentioned before, the Darby fight isn't the first time we'd see a manga about someone outsmarting their opponents rather than beating them with a new ability or weapon. The earlier parts of JoJo's, especially Part 2, Battle Tendency, actually excels at this. But there's another manga that I believe also influenced Takahashi, and it was also by Hirohiko Araki. Cool Shock BT is about two boys named Koichi and BT. As they get themselves into trouble, which BT solves by using magic tricks that appear to be supernatural but are revealed to have practical explanations. BT's stories are almost like a prototype of the Darby Brothers, with characters even making similar bets like when the Nazi camp leaders make a bet if a car will turn right or left, similar to the gamble with Darby's cat. Araki actually said that BT's personality was an inspiration for Part 2's Joseph Joestar, who despite fighting his opponents physically, does so in a way that he has to trick or outsmart them. You're probably thinking, well, if BT is so much like Darby and Joseph Joestar, why even bother mentioning it? And the reason is twofold. First of all, I believe that BT's design influenced Takahashi's art style, specifically BT's large, detailed eyes, which are very reminiscent of the large eyes Takahashi gives his characters. Secondly, because in JoJo's, regardless of the part, the enemies they fight are always superpowered. Vampires that plan to subjugate humanity, ancient beings that strive to become the ultimate life form, stand users who have strange and powerful abilities, the enemies in BT, on the other hand, are just people. Regular people like bullies and camp counselors who abuse their authority and take advantage of the weaker children. The kinds of people that a real young boy might have to deal with in their own life. Similarly, the early chapters of Yu-Gi-Oh! deal specifically with these types of enemies. A school bully, an abusive teacher, a teenage gang. Even in Seto Kaiba's first appearance, he isn't anything over the top, he's just a rich kid that thinks he's better than everyone. The manga doesn't introduce an opponent who has supernatural powers until chapter 13 with Shadi. And we wouldn't see a character I would consider a traditional manga supervillain until Kaiba's return in the Death T arc, starting in chapter 26. And the only reason Takahashi brought him back was because Jump was getting a ton of fan mail begging them to expand on the Duel Monsters card game, which was known as Magic and Wizards at the time. Part of me wonders if Duel Monsters didn't take off if Yu-Gi-Oh would have continued down the path of mostly mundane villains. But the world may never know. This last series didn't have as strong of an influence, but I still think it's worth mentioning, and that's the series Kaiji. Kaiji was a manga published in February of 1996, predating Yu-Gi-Oh! by only a few months. The series follows a man named Ito Kaiji, who goes into severe debt, but is offered a way out by taking part in a gambling event. Contestants arrive on a ship called the Espoir, where they play a game where winning means their debt is erased, but losing means they'll be forever indebted to the company, with many being forced into labor in these illegal underground camps. Throughout the manga, Kaiji participates in various games as he attempts to free himself from the debt he acquired, and like Yu-Gi-Oh, this includes gambles that are both based on pre-existing games and new games entirely of the author's invention. 
The first game is restricted rock, paper, scissors, with the twist being that it's played with cards. Every player gets four rock, four paper, and four scissors, along with three star chips. The point of the game is to use up all 12 cards while maintaining at least three stars. Adding to the psychological aspect, players are also allowed to take out a loan before playing, and this access to money adds a new psychological layer to the game. At the start of the event, a man named Funai approaches Kaiji with a plan to end the game quickly. His plan is to intentionally end every game in a draw so that both him and his partner will end with zero cards but three stars. After several draws, Funai accidentally wins a round, forcing Kaiji to hand over a star. Funai assures him that he'll lose the next round on purpose to even the score, but using sleight of hand, he manages to win another game from Kaiji. Kaiji is left with barely any cards and a single star, and this is because the access to money creates an ecosystem where all resources have value. Excess stars can be sold for money, and the closer the event gets to the end, the more desperate players become, and the more valuable those stars are. This incentivizes greedier players, or players with higher debt, to win in excess of three stars so that they can sell their extra stars for more money, and Kaiji immediately fell into a trap. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s first arc centering around the Duel Monsters card game Duelist Kingdom also used star chips, but the real similarities are in the writing. The way both Nobuyuki Fukumoto and Kazuki Takahashi start their character off in their most vulnerable point, forcing them to come up with unique strategies to come out on top. At the start of the tournament, Yugi receives two star chips, but he learns that his friend Jonochi wishes to enter the tournament too because he needs the prize money to pay for his sister's eye operation. In order for Jonochi to compete in the tournament, Yugi offers him one of his star chips, but this means that both Yugi and Jonochi are starting off in a position where a single loss means their complete elimination from the tournament. Takahashi continues to make sure Yugi is always at a disadvantage, first by nerfing his deck, Say goodbye to it! and then by introducing a field power bonus mechanic that always seems to give his opponents a better advantage than it gives him. Side note, the prize money for winning is 3 million yen. At the time, this would have equaled about $20,000, but the English dub changed it from 3 million yen to just 3 million dollars. So I guess Serenity's operation required inventing cyborg eyes. And then in season two, when Joey says he doesn't have much money left over from the operation, I guess it implies he has a drug habit because the dude did not spend the money on trading cards. He's playing Swordsman of Landstar. Similarly to how the rules and restrictions in Kaiji made rock, paper, scissors more than a simple game of chance, the dual fields introduced in the Duelist Kingdom arc add a layer of strategy to an otherwise simplistic game. Rather than just attacking with stronger monsters, Yugi has to come up with creative ways to defeat his opponents based on how his and his opponent's monsters interact with the environment. And it's kind of a shame that these duels are the subject of a lot of jokes in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community, mostly due to them not following the actual rules of the official card game. But what I think people don't realize is that the TCG at the time didn't have official rules, other than what was explained in earlier chapters of the manga. Attack with stronger monsters, do damage, win. There was no real strategy to it, but Takahashi made it interesting by injecting these tabletop RPG elements. Using Catapult Turtle to launch Gaia the Dragon Champion into Castle of Dark Illusion's flotation ring sounds absurd and complicated in the context of a card game, but in a tabletop RPG, this could be an actual strategy, and so I think it's unfortunate that these episodes get a bad rep just for being, you know, creative. Back to Kaiji though. As Kaiji goes on, we'd see the games escalate, with him playing for larger sums of money to full-on games of life or death. And this may have influenced some of the duels we'd see later on in the series, particularly in the Battle City arc. The Battle City arc that follows Duelist Kingdom likewise raises the stakes with full-on life-or-death duels, like the duel with Pandora where life points are counted by a saw blade that upon reaching zero will cut off the legs of the player who loses. There's also the duel with Mask of Darkness and Mask of Light, where your life points hitting zero activates a bomb that shatters a glass ceiling sending you falling to your death. Kaiji may not be the kind of shonen action series packed with supernatural elements that Takahashi was a fan of, but the Battle City arc is so full of people trying to kill Yugi and his friends in non-supernatural ways that at some point it just starts to feel like a Nobuyuki Fukumoto joint, if you know what I mean. Now remember when I said Kaiji was going to be the last series I talk about? That's what John you did! I lied. <laughs> There's one more series I want to talk about, and this series had the most profound influence on Yu-Gi-Oh! Without this series, Yu-Gi-Oh! would be nothing. It would be nowhere near the juggernaut of the card game world it is today. And the manga I'm talking about is called DNA Squared. DNA Squared is about a future where a mega playboy has completely ruined the future by knocking up so many women that it has led to horrible overpopulation. A woman named Karin is sent back in time with a bullet that will eliminate the Mega Playboy gene, which she uses on the main character Junta. Unfortunately, due to a mix-up, she accidentally shoots him with the wrong bullet, turning him into the Mega Playboy. 
Now Junta has two forms, a boy who's so allergic to women that he throws up when he tries to talk to them, and the irresistible mega playboy who's destined to destroy the future. This is another series where Takahashi has never openly talked about it influencing him. However, I am 99% sure that Takahashi got the design for Yugi's hair from Junta. Seeing Junta side by side with the Mega Playboy version really gives me a major Yugi Yami vibe. And the early chapters of Yu-Gi-Oh! even have more etchy humor, like Yugi imagining Anzu's skirt flying up when she plays basketball. But a lot of this humor wound up getting phased out of the manga relatively quickly. Regardless, I still think DNA Squared influenced Yu-Gi-Oh! by way of Junta's ridiculous hair, and with the main character having two forms as an awkward teenager or a mega playboy. But that's just a theory. A f theory. Thanks for watching. Maggie.